Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming this afternoon and welcome. We've been trying to get this on the road for the last couple of months, but certain things keep interfering. But we're all here today, so hopefully we'll, uh, we'll depart this knowledge to you. So we're uh, starting to look at the sequence of events that'll happen between now and Christmas with respect to the college planning and the certain things that everyone has to do to get there. So um, I will hand this over to Miss Jill Newman. She is with us this year, and Miss Cerise Roth Vincent, there she is, will be with us next year in August coming back. So she's sitting in on this as well. So I'll give you over to Jill now. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. And uh, just so you know, this is being recorded. So if you need to listen to this again, or you'd like to share it with other people, uh, which we encourage you to do, uh, much appreciated. Um, for next year, the students I will be working with have the last name starting with M through Y. We have no students with the last name of Z, otherwise I would have them too. And uh, the other students, A through L, Ms. Roth, Ms. Roth Vinson will have, uh, and she's been working with them already on her own time. So that was been, that's been very nice. Um, I will just use this, actually. We have this in three segments. This first segment is mine, and it's going over the college application process, a process that we want you as parents to be very familiar with because your students should become very familiar with it. Um, uh, we'll be going into detail and happy to answer questions towards the end of the presentation. Okay, so this is number one through 14. And I've indicated on the slide when your students should be working on these. So you'll see three different um, pizzazzes. It's either now, June, or summer. So to start off with, every student has already been on their Cialfo account. That's the college uh, database. And what helps us to make sure the applications go out to the appropriate schools. Every student has been asked to update current information, including how the, the passports that they hold, uh, especially if it's Taiwanese, we need to know what the other passport is as well. Uh, their personal email, current home address, cell phone numbers, contact information for parents, and several other things in the profile section of Cialfo. And also we want them to update their questionnaire. Every student has a 10 to 15 uh, questions on the questionnaire that we want them to be very thoughtful and fill out. It, they have access to it. Once they fill it out, they can continue to fill out more information as they know more information. And that helps us write their letter of recommendation. Really important. Number two, uh, one of the ways to figure out a good college search, and we'll, I'll go into a college search a little bit further on, uh, is to go to College Board's Big Future page, and on it is the college search function. It's, um, Cialfo also has a college search function. I suggest doing both and students can see which colleges end up on both lists because then that indicates a really good match. Uh, students make choices on there as to what's important and how important it is, and the search function will come up with good matches of colleges, and then the student should investigate and research those colleges. So th starting that now as well. There is a create a resume function on uh, Cialfo on the, the front page of it. We want students to create their resume. That's important because for number four, they're going to be asking two of their junior teachers, two of the teachers they have currently in their junior year, uh, for letters of recommendation. Not that the uh, teachers are going to write the letter of recommendation right now, but it is important to ask them. Some will write it over summer, Others will wait until the fall, but the resume is a really great anchor for them to concentrate on perhaps giving them information about a student that they wouldn't already know. So the student should be filling out the resume now. 
And again, that can continuously be updated. Uh, just kind of circling around again with number four, we want students to ask their teachers, the two that they choose, by June. A teacher might say, no, I'm not really ready to write you a letter of recommendation. That gives a student enough time to find another teacher to write a letter of recommendation. But we, would, we want students to be prepared to ask for at least two teachers their letters of rec. And again, they're not writing it now. They're, we're just anticipating them writing it. And, at, and the students should be asking them nicely to do that. Number five, if any students are considering applying to University of California or UC schools, there are tips for writing the UC personal insight questions. And um, doing that over summer is important because those are very thought-provoking questions. They need time, they need editing, and over summer is a really good time to figure out which ones the students are going to choose to write on and start writing. Number six, many of our students apply through Common App and uh, it's important for them to fill out their profile on Common App and to get that started. There is one primary essay that you write on Common App for all Common App colleges that the student is applying to. Then after that, many colleges have a supplemental essay, but to start with, at least get the Common App um, profile done and start on the essay. There are some universities that choose to go through coalition for colleges. That's yet another, it's like, it's like Common App, but different. Uh, some of uh, the colleges that students apply to use this format. So we do have students who need to be looking at UCs, Common App, Coalition, and some directly apply to campuses. So this year I had students um, maybe have four or five different formats that they had to contend with for applications. So something to be aware of early on so that you can be working on that. Uh, number seven, writing the first drafts of the essays so that uh, when fall starts, they can ask teachers and their counselor to look over the essays. Eight, uh, we're a little unsure about testing right now. Uh, we try to keep up on whatever is being said by College Board or ACT. We did put this in there though because many of our students forget that there is another test that's just as valid and that's ACT. Um, some of our students actually do better on ACT than they do on SAT. So this is just a reminder ACT is another opportunity to um, take a college admissions test. Um, later on in our presentation, we will be going over testing and what the class of 2021 might expect um, regarding colleges and how they feel about admissions and testing. Number, number nine is going to be important, especially if students apply to Canadian universities but some US universities, UK universities, and so forth. The TOEFL or IELTS exams uh, are going to be important. Some are, the TOEFL online? The TOEFL is online and available, from my understanding, to be taken at home during certain times. Some uh, colleges are actually starting to accept the online Duolingo test for English. So this, these are all English proficiency exams. And um, many times if a student says that they've been schooled at an American, an international American school, that's not a problem. They believe that their English proficiency is high enough, but not every campus and not every country believes in that. So some of our students do need to take this. 10, uh, financial aid, and this is primarily for Citizen, I'd say U.S. citizens, um, they're going to be filling out the FAFSA, the Federal Aid Finan oh no, <laughs> FAFSA, Financial Aid Federal, we'll go with FAFSA, um, 
and we can put more details in there. Uh, there's actually, these are all linked, by the way. Uh, when we send out this presentation, we can maybe send out a linked version of it. Uh, FAFSA is for federal aid for students, so that's United States federal aid. And the CSS profile is used by some private colleges to give additional consideration for financial aid. Um, we do need to do this. We need to know if your student is applying for early decision and or early action. Early decision means a student is very interested in applying to one university. They have to fill out, um, they have to fill out a commitment form. You sign it. The counselor signs it. The student signs it. We acknowledge it in a common app that the student has filled this out. And it is a binding decision, meaning that if the student does get in under early decision, the student will attend that university. Early action gives you a little more flexibility. It's also for a student who's interested in applying to maybe up to, at most, three early action uh, colleges. We don't recommend it, but three at most, uh, showing that you have definite interest in, a, in attending the college. The difference is it's not binding. So you have a little more flexibility with uh, what you want to do with that. Counselors need to know though, because we have a lot to do in a very short period of time if a student is applying for ED or EA schools. So those are decisions that need to be made during summer prior to coming back to school. And then obviously letting your counselor know. Uh, these are other places to find information if a student is interested in applying to something other than the United States. So um, each of these, again, are linked, um, and we have more information in our office if you'd like to come. But these are good places to start. If, and uh, from the little bit of information that we've gotten so far from your students, um, many are still interested in applying to United States universities but also Canadian, Australian, uh, UK, Japanese, and so forth. So all good information and, again, decisions, to, uh, things to be thinking about over summer. Okay, number 13. This is where we get into the actual college list. We want students to arrive back at school in the fall with a draft version of their applying list. In C Alpha, there's three kinds of lists. There's long list, short list, and applying. Long list would be maybe when you first do the search in College Board or in C Alpha, and you come up with maybe 30 or so colleges. And you're thinking, yeah, OK, I'm going to dig down and research a little bit more. That would be the long list. A short list would maybe take that list from 30 to 20 or 18 where now you've cut some off and you're figuring out, okay, now I want to do even further research. Your applying list really is what you intend on, at least at the start of the school year, what you intend on applying to. Um, we know that there's still going to be some shuffling around, but we want that shuffling to be minimized. Um, I had a student applying literally at the last moment and giving me 20 colleges, which was almost impossible to do. We got it done. I don't want to do that again. Uh, it didn't really work as well for the student. So um, we really want your students to do front loading. Do the research now. Get it done before you start back at school. Um, what we suggest as far as knowing what good fits are, because for every student, this is going to look different. Uh, we want at least two. This doesn't mean that you're only applying to six colleges, but we want at least two in each of the following categories. Two likelies. Around a 65% chance or greater for your student to get into college, into that college. Two targets. Around 50%, let's say 40 to 60% range of your student to get into that college and two reaches around a 35% chance or less of your student getting into that college. And of course, all of these, we want your student to be really excited about. We don't want someone to put on a school that is a 
uh, a likely and they're like, well, I, I can get in, but I really don't want to go. That's kind of a waste of time and money and effort and a lot of other people who are involved with getting your, your student ready to apply. So we really want these to be honed in on and, and students to be excited about them. Um, at most, we would see a student maybe apply to 15 colleges. Uh, if a student is applying to UC schools, that can be considered one, even if they apply to three UC schools, that's still one application. But for the most part, 15 is, is like the most that we'd like to see. Most of our students uh, applied to 12. And uh, because they did their work ahead of time, they got good results. Uh, you're going to be spending time with, uh, with your child's counselor, college counselor, and uh, we're going to help uh, make that kind of decision with your student and yourself as to what the fit is. But we want you to do some of the work now. And that's really going for the students, I'm saying that, but parents, we need your help. Um, that's it for my section. The next section oops, is Mr. Bishop's. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let me see if this thing works first. Nope, didn't think so. Okay. Um, a few choices that we have other than um, academic that we should look at, I think, when your child is going off to university. Uh, for example, what, is, what citizenship are you applying with? As Jill mentioned before, American citizenship, other citizenship. I know that all the students here at this school have two passports, so we need to know them both because if you apply as an American, there are different rules if you apply for one, with one from the Philippines, for example, or some other country. Okay, you have to look at the programs that they're applying to. Um, now, uh, the biggest uh, problem with, with this is that students come in and say, well, what, what major am I going to apply for? Well, you don't necessarily apply directly to a major. First of all, like, think about it this way. Break it down with respect to which degree do you want. Do you want a business degree? Do you want a communications degree? Do you want an arts degree? Then look a little deeper, once you apply for that degree, into the faculties. It could be the Faculty of Science, the Faculty of Commerce, whatever. And then you would look at what subject you want to take as your major. Okay, in most liberal arts colleges, your, your major is not chosen until your third year. So you don't need to know exactly what you have to study when you go in for year one. Students are encouraged to look around for the first two years to find their uh, interests and their skills in certain areas, okay? What kind of learning environment do you want? The, I mean, I think at this school, students are used to this kind of teaching by teachers. Hands-on, you know, a lot of hands-on stuff, laboratories, lectures, and things. Some schools, for example, in the UK, deal with that. They also... Uh, split the students up into small tutor groups or study groups and then they would come into a lecture hall for example once or twice a week and listen to a professor lecture for two to three hours about a certain subject. So that's kind of a different uh, method of education compared to what they're used to here. Um, admission requirements, you should look at those. Um, California, the UC schools is probably one of the most transparent websites. I, I love them, they're great because there's, there's no stone left unturned. You know everything that they, re that they need, that they want, whatever, they write it out for you in black and white. So look at those, please, and you'll find out exactly what the admission requirements are for certain faculties or for certain majors. Um, what system, again, Hong Kong, UK versus USA or Canadian, a uh, little bit of a different system. The Hong Kong um, and UK, of course, is mainly British, or Singaporean schools, some of them too, are based on British background. So talk to us about that. Um, standardized tests, right now the universities are, uh, while well, they're thinking about what's coming on for next year, and it's good, it's kind of forcing a change because something like TOEFL, for example, it was difficult to access sometimes, so now they're saying, okay, well, you can write it at home. So that's a definite plus about re-emerging re and re reassessing all these different ways of testing. Um, we don't know what that's going to look like for next year, but already 
for your sons and daughters, most of the universities are saying that testing is not required for many of the universities, but check the website just to be sure, okay? And your future plans, where would you like to stay? Some students with an American passport can stay in America. Some with a Canadian passport can stay in Canada. I know Australia would make it easy for students to stay and work and stay after they're finished their degree. So that's a possibility as well. I guess it's a little difficult to look maybe five or 10 years down the road and say where you want to be. Oops, sorry. <clears throat> okay. What can parents do to help? Well, I think you know your kids best. You know, take a look and you've known them since this high. Um, what, what kind of skills do they have? What do they like as a person, compassionate person? Do they like doing certain things? Are they helpful doing certain things? Take a look at their strengths and sit down with them and actually make a list with them. And I bet you you would surprise them. Because some of the things that you would say to them, they'd say, like, why do you think that? The most difficult thing that we, when we work with kids to ask them, they say, so tell me about yourself. Dead silence. They can't tell us about themselves sometimes. So by doing this with your kids, it's great. It teaches them that, oh, okay, well, I guess I am like this. And that fosters that type of attitude as well. They need a reason to do this for themselves. Many times students are just going to university because that's what's expected. Um, they don't, you know, in that case, they don't take a, an active role in it. And if they see something that they like or they're interested in, they take a more active role in applying to university. So if they can find a reason for themselves to go, not just because mom and dad want them to go, then that's great. Support them. Don't do all the work for them. There's a difference. I've run into many family members over the years who have... Um, use their own term of support a little differently. In other words, they've done their essays for them, they've done the application forms for them. Um, not good. So please support them. They're the ones going to college, not you. They're going to be on their own next year and they're going to have to do all this themselves anyway. Um, so please just give them a support and give them a little push along when they get stuck on something. And that's a great way to support them. Um, devise a timeline using, using a planner or a calendar. It's always good. When they come back from the summer, things are going to be going very fast. So it would be great if they did an Excel sheet on the colleges they're applying to, what they've done, what essay is due, when it's due, all these different things so they can keep track of their applications. Um, and lastly, discuss your child's responsibilities with them. What are their responsibilities with respect to this whole process? And what are yours, what are the schools, and what are, what are ours as counselors? Okay, so again, student responsibility. Who does what? Uh, the student has to do all the applications and supplements, which is a lot of work. Uh, the application fee process, I guess that would be out of mom and dad's pocket. Um, obtain a visa at the AIT in Taipei. Right now, that is closed, so we're not sure when it's going to be open, but they will give us notice so that they can deal with the visa process later on. Um, an early decision agreement, if they're applying for early decision, they would have to fill that out. That's on the common application. Now, this is only for American schools, okay? Canadian schools don't require it, or Australian, or any other schools. Only U.S. has ED. Um, all the essays that they have to write for different colleges. Again, Canada doesn't require essays. Um, Australia doesn't. So it's, it's mainly the American universities that we're focusing on this afternoon. Requesting SAT scores through the College Board or ETS. They have to, that's their responsibility to contact them. We cannot send in a copy of their SAT score. They will not accept it from us. It has to be directly from the issuing institution. And lastly, a financial statement of funds for non-U.S. citizens. That basically is for the visa purposes. Uh, you may have to, as a parent, you may have to take a trip to your bank and have a form filled out that says there are adequate funds in an account to cover one year of university. Okay, and that will help process their visa. Okay, uh, school responsibilities. What we do, we provide the school profile all the transcripts that are necessary, letters of recommendation from the teachers, counselor's recommendation, 
and they have to mail in applications that can't be electronically sent. Cialfo is great for sending documents, but not all the universities are in a receiving mode for that. So the kids have to keep track of which ones I can send electronically and which ones they have to see Denise, Miss Denise about, the secretary, to send to the universities. An easy thing to do. They'll know how to do that once we get into this in September. Okay, counselor's recommendations. What we usually do is meet with each student individually to discuss choices. And I know that these two ladies have been working really hard this semester to do that, and they just finished today, right? Yeah, good stuff. So they've met with every student individually in grade 11 and uh, talked about their choices and what they would like to do and so on. So meet with parents and students together if possible. You are more than welcome to book an appointment with your counselor and sit down uh, so that all three of you and can, or four of you can uh, discuss opportunities in the colleges. Manage student documents to be sent on Cialfo. We send them in electronically through that. It's very easy to do. Assist the student with application forms of any kind. Help students choose a manageable list of colleges. Here's the tricky one. Uh, like Jill was talking about before, the, um, it's a good thing usually to stick to around 12 colleges. I've had parents at the very last minute come in and say, okay, here's another 10 schools I want you to apply to. Well, two, pro two problems with that. Number one is last minute. And number two, you have no idea how detailed some of these applications can be. And the students are just really super stressed at that time. And so please don't jump the gun and say, here's another 10 more, go for it. You know, They will get into good universities. There's no reason to stress out about it. Um, but if everything is done along the line in a methodical way, we should be OK. Uh, send in required documents at appropriate times, which we do. We keep them on deadline. And um, so if the main thing is the best thing that they could do is communicate with us. It's really difficult to do if we can't get a hold of your kids. We're not that far. They know we are where we are all the time, but we don't where the, know where they are. So, Okay, and lastly, Cerise is going to talk to you about looking ahead and the possibilities and what may or may not happen with this virus our favorite topic of the day. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. Thanks for showing up to talk with us. It's really been a pleasure to meet with your kids. It is really, really fun to talk with them about their future. And they have such great ambition and dreams. And it's, it's just been a joy. So I'm looking forward to working with all of your sons and daughters next, next year. OK, a lot of questions we're getting from parents and also from your students is, what is going to happen next year with the virus? How is this going to impact current students who are leaving? How is this going to impact future students, your kids, as they go through the admissions process? So we want to just talk about a few of those and hopefully give you some information that makes things more clear and also helps you to prepare a little more accurately for the future. So there are a couple topics we'll go over. What's changing in admissions policies and requirements? We're getting updates about that daily from universities. What's happening with potential delayed start dates, distance learning that's happening at universities currently, some travel-related issues, testing and exams are changing, um, what are universities putting out? What is their perspective? Uh, what are they planning for? And then how do we keep track for the future? How do we find out about current changes and what's coming? So these are the topics I want to talk about just a little bit. And then we'll be happy to also answer any questions that you guys have. Um, changes to admissions policies. Universities are putting out updates almost daily. I know I'm getting five to ten emails a day. I know they are as well. The fact is that this is a very changing situation. And universities who thought they might be closing for a couple of weeks, spring break, a month, now find themselves closed for the semester doing virtual learning. They're also starting to look ahead at what does this mean for the class of 2021, your kids, and what that means. So they're, they're each going about this a little differently and releasing information that's unique to that institution. 
As your student puts universities on a list they are considering, I highly recommend that you sign up for their updates. Almost all of them have a blog or a newsletter where they're releasing information about their changes. Most of them are offering a lot more flexibility and a lot of compassion to your students. They understand that this is a really uncertain time and they're saying it's okay. We're ready to look at your transcripts in a, in a different way if we need to. We understand students are not going to have the same extracurricular activities. We understand, we're compassionate, we will work with you. They want your students. This is a hard situation for them too. So they are really responding with a lot of understanding. Also a big impact changing for them financially. Universities are worried about their enrollment, worried about making their numbers, worried about programs that have been canceled, uh, worried about keeping their faculty, uh, but also families are being impacted worldwide. Um, so again, all of this is context for how universities worldwide are going to change some of the ways in which they admit future students, certainly the class of 2021, possibly the class after that as well. In the US, institutions and admission people are very familiar with what we call holistic admissions. This word basically means they take everything into consideration. They don't just look at grades they never have. They don't just look at whether or not you can pay. They don't look at any one particular piece. So in the US, I feel like um, the response has really been very similar. You know, they're saying it's okay if we don't have all the pieces of the application that we're used to seeing. That's okay. We're used to looking at every piece and making a decision. So if we don't have a particular test or we don't have a perfect transcript the way that we're used to seeing it, that that is going to be okay. Uh, as many of you might know, uh, the University of California suspended SAT and ACT requirements for your students. So if your child has not taken the SAT or ACT, most likely they are going to be okay. Every day a new institution is telling us we will not require the SAT. No SAT required for the class of 2021. The reality is so many dates have been canceled. There's not equal access to the test. The environment for taking the test, the finances of taking the test are all at risk. So these are some big changes to admission policies. I mean, I don't think any of us ever thought it would be possible to see this many universities eliminate the SAT as a cutoff or as a requirement for application, but this year, we've been given that opportunity, that advantage, and I'm encouraging your students, you know, if you have taken it and you're happy with your score, if you fall somewhere in the average for an institution, it's a good idea. Go ahead and submit your score. It's probably going to help you. If you've taken the SAT and you're not happy with your score or you plan to retake it, we can talk about it and make a decision together on whether or not you want to include that test. Does that make sense? So that's a huge, big change for next year. The situation with delayed start dates and distance learning, I think, is going to potentially have an impact as well. Uh, universities right now are actively planning different scenarios. Some are looking at they've canceled summer school, canceled summer enrichment programs. Probably many of you thought, oh, I'll go this summer and visit a school or go to a science camp or enroll in a competition. All of that is being canceled one after another. So this is a, an impact of the coronavirus as well on, on our university admissions. Lots of universities are thinking about delaying the start of their fall semester, moving to online learning for the first semester. Uh, very strong considerations for this class. Of course, that brings up the question for me, probably you too. Well, what does that mean for my student if this year students are either not going, delaying, deferring, uh, and then they decide to go to school a year from now, how will that impact your students? And the question is, we actually don't know. We're all still learning how this will impact future admissions, but we know that there will be some impact. We know there will be some change. Uh, I'm not sure if that's good or bad. We talk about it all the time. Uh, it could be positive. I think schools are going to need students to come back. They're going to need the enrollment to, you know, continue their operations. Uh, but it 
we don't know what that will look like. If students from this year defer their start date, how will that impact future classes? So this is something we're monitoring, thinking about, talking about a lot. Travel related. So well, we are all experiencing this. We're very grateful that we were in Taiwan. I'm so proud and very happy to be here. Um, we're very lucky. But it also means that we have fewer people from universities coming to visit us. Normally in spring and normally in fall, we would be welcoming university after university, your students, you meet with them. And this year, that's very unlikely. Um, we don't know yet for sure how many have canceled their fall plans, but this is the time of year when uh, normally we would be seeing those get scheduled and we can expect a lot fewer visits. Likewise, your students and you will not have the experience probably very easily of going to visit universities and seeing what it's like in person. And that's a really exciting piece. Um, so that is something we're, we're also trying to manage and talk about. How do you choose a university if you have no opportunity to go visit, see the area, experience the weather, get a sense of the culture? Uh, as we talked about, summer programs canceled. And then as Greg mentioned, the AIT services for routine student visas is currently suspended and closed. Um, we're waiting instruction about what that means for students who plan to start in fall 2020. Um, I would expect these services would resume sometime this coming, you know, before it affects your students. But that is something we're seeing embassies closed around the world for different services to the U.S. Uh, as travel has been banned and suspended. I feel like I don't have the fun part of this presentation. <laughs> It's just, it's, it's part of the reality of, of what, what we're dealing with, and we really want to prepare you. We want to prepare your students. So what can they be doing instead? If they're not going to summer programs, they're not doing visits, we don't have reps coming here, what should your student do instead? Number one is register for virtual college fairs. There was a big one over spring break. We sent information to your students. There will be more just like that, where representatives get on a Zoom call, and make themselves available for a presentation and then chats and questions from future students. We see a lot of those coming out. As we see them, your students should participate. Those of you students in the room, <laughs> we hope to see you sign up for those. Also, many, many, uh, almost all universities now around the world have a virtual campus tour. So go do a virtual campus tour. Look at their YouTube channel and um, there are guest lectures by professors and a lot of great content that will help you choose a better school for yourself. Engage with them online, join their Zoom sessions, subscribe to their social media, follow their blog, sign up for their newsletter. It's really important for your student to show engagement. This is something that uh, many schools track. They want to know, are you just putting this school on the list because you like the name? Or do you actually want to go here? Are you engaged with our campus? Are you following our social media? Are you receiving information from us? Um, and that's information they like to track. You can take an online class. I've talked to a lot of students, you know, what to do with your summer. If you thought you were going to be in the US on a program, could you take an online class? Could you learn a new subject, practice a different language? Is there something enriching that you can do with your time? I think that's really important. Universities are going to be looking for how did you take advantage of this opportunity if you had it? Again, we're really, really lucky that we're in Taiwan. We're able to stay in school, have classes, and that's really uh, a wonderful, wonderful benefit. So how can they make the most of their time? All right, testing. We've talked about this some. All of you probably know IB exams were canceled this year. That's another first. None of us ever could have imagined that IB would cancel exams. Uh, of course, we're very ho I'm very hopeful next year that exams will occur. This year, what they're doing instead is asking teachers and students essentially to compile information, upload it to IB, and they are reviewing each student's body of work and giving a score and a diploma based on that evidence. So it's
as I was saying, it's, it's not that they won't receive the diploma, they will absolutely continue to receive the IB diploma, but they just may not have traditional exams. So this is a question mark, lots of question marks today. Uh, colleges are ready. If we do have a change or we need to report a particular class a different way on a transcript, many colleges have already made announcements. Pass-fail is okay. Uh, missing credits, incomplete credits, they're ready to accept whatever format is necessary. If a, if a school needs to make a change for the safety of students and community, they're already ready to interpret the transcripts and academic record as is. Um, admissions test, again, they're canceled, but you know some are being offered online, some you can do at home. Um, we talked about should your students send in the scores. I think majority of your students I'm talking with, their scores are excellent. They're really good. So if they've taken the SAT, a lot of them I said, yes, please, you should, you should submit your score. And at the end, if you guys have questions, we can also help you um, with some questions about testing in particular. So perspectives from the university. I just picked a couple to kind of highlight the type of language that they're using, the kind of messaging they're doing to students. One of these is from Swarthmore College, another from you know, highly ranked Northwestern. Um, in bold, I've put here, you know, simply put, take care of yourself first and don't worry about the college admissions process for now. Northwestern said, good news is that we always try to understand an ac applicant's academic context before evaluating their academic record. So again, this, this idea and this message coming again and again, take care of yourself, don't worry about it, do your best, stay healthy. We are happy to look at your application, whatever condition, whatever missing information, it's going to be okay. So I think we all understand that this is a really unusual time and it is going to impact admissions and they're okay with that. They're okay with those changes. So going forward, I know I look at a lot, of, I read a lot of information, lots of different sources. One place is collecting it, it's the College Admissions Status Update. I'll put the link here. It's put out by NACAC, N-A-C-A-C. But there are lots of places that are giving updates about universities. On this link, each university has a summary of changes they've made to admissions and to their campuses because of COVID-19. Everything from we are closed, or we're doing distance learning, or we went test optional, uh, we delayed our start date, we extended our deposit date. Uh, if they've made a change in policies and admissions, they are announcing it on this website and they're tracking all that information updated daily. So that's kind of one good source. Okay. Thank you guys, I appreciate you coming. I hope this is helpful information and now we'll be happy to take some of your questions. All right, anyone have a question for us? We covered a lot of information. I had forgotten to mention when uh, I was up that your students have met with us, we did say that, but also they've come away with a list of things to do. Please ask them about that. Um, that it should not be a surprise to anyone as to what to do, but we really need parents to, you know, help maybe kick them forward, some of them. Other ones are right on top of it, so we appreciate that. We gave them college homework. We definitely gave them college homework. <laughs> well, thank you very much for attending. Very much appreciate it. We'll be up here to answer individual questions as best we can. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks